Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by David Spadey. He's with Americans for Prosperity. He is a filmmaker, a political consultant, all-around interesting guy. We're going to learn a little bit more about the method behind his madness. David, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. So, as I said, you, you're into all sorts of things, Salem Communications being another thing. Um, all things conservative and liberty-minded, you're involved, but how did you first decide this is who you wanted to be when you grew up? Well, I was born and raised in Montana, so I'm a, a country boy that moved to California for college. And in college, I realized there was a real deficit of common sense, something that we had more of in Montana, but still a deficit there as well. Um, and that's something that got me involved in wanting to shape worldview with common sense ideas. And I lean conservative because I think that conservative ideas deal with common sense. We may not even like the outcomes many times, but we don't live in sort of utopian idealism that much of the left does when it comes to what shapes the way we think. So I've spent the last 25 years involved in politics and media, but with that idea in mind, how do we message, how do we communicate common sense, and how does that turn into policies that actually improve people's lives? Right, and so just out of curiosity, what school was it? Azusa Pacific University. Okay. And I got a master's degree at Cal State San Bernardino okay. in national security studies. Okay. So luckily you weren't corrupted at Berkeley or someplace else that would really um, make well, you question your sanity. The surprising thing was that I was at a fairly conservative school and I was questioning my sanity. Uh, just dealing with the professors and some of the students and just how they came to the conclusions they did, which to me didn't involve a lot of common sense. Right. And so you've literally taken almost every angle uh, imaginable to put your ideas out there, which are not just your ideas, but as you said, people who common sense applies to and appeals to uh, the, the political consulting realm, media, um, the, the filmmaking components, which we'll get into a little bit, uh, and then fundraising for conservative or libertarian types of causes in many cases. Um, is there anything on the horizon that you're also going to dabble in that would expand that? And why did you choose the various mechanisms that you've chosen? Well, when you say dabble, am I ever going to consider running for office myself or putting myself into a policymaker uh, uh, position? And I, the answer is no. I, I really enjoy what I do behind the scenes. I think I have more influence there than I would in front of uh, the process. And so. There's not really anything that's a dramatic shift of, of what I'm doing. I guess the shifts would be more subtle shifts maybe in how we approach things. Uh, we live in a changing world and we have to, to adapt to that at times, uh, both how we do politics, whether it's how we're knocking on doors and the kind of data we're using, or if it's on the messaging front with what kind of vehicles uh, we're using for our messaging. Right. And you talked about even in demographics like California it being such a different information set in the Central Valley than there is and a different life experience than there is in the urban areas of the state that have more influence over what happens at the polls. And I'm sure that's the same thing that you're seeing on a national level. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. There's, there's no de question, especially in the state of California. It's very stark. It's almost like there's two different states, the urban coastal area and then the rural Central Valley in Northern California. Very different value sets. And when you look at uh, you know, the shifts just in demographics, in 1900, 60% of people lived in rural areas. Today, about 20% do. So there's a real disconnect just from a pure value standpoint and understanding of, of what shapes the world views of both of those different groups. And uh, people that live in cities often have no idea you know, the struggles of what happens in, in rural America. But in a state like California, the majority of those representing people in Sacramento, because they come from the population centers, are, are writing laws and everything that, that affect that rural area, but they don't have the same representation. One example simply is on energy. Uh, if the price of energy goes up uh, for cooling or heating your home, and you live on the coast where you can open your windows and have your home cooled very easily, or if you live inland in a rural area where it costs a lot for your air conditioning during the summer, energy prices mean a lot more. Yep. So there's a real disconnect and, and sort of a lack of maybe empathy you have with urban lawmakers when it comes to things as simple as that. Well, we see it even in the situation where I live in Livermore, which is about 25 miles east of San Francisco, that kind of a thing. But 
for example, in the urban centers, they like public transportation, they like BART, and they don't think that people should allow, be allowed to have parking spaces because if you're riding the train, then you should probably get there on the bus or walk, not realizing that out where I am, it could be 30 or 40 degrees hotter during the summer, yeah. and we have old people that you don't want to walk three miles in 115 degree heat because it has health effects and ramifications on them. So it's just not possible or sensible, but they live in a microcosm. They think that all the world is like them, and it's just not true. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you see a lot of that with policies with regards to transportation. Um, California is a state, particularly in Los Angeles, that absolutely relies on uh, your, your car. And this idea that we're going to you know, get people out of cars, get them in some kind of mass transit, uh, public transportation, it's one of these, again, utopian ideals. It's absolutely not practical. It's not going to happen in Los Angeles. We can you know, try every mechanism to force it down the throats of people, but people want that mobility, and especially in Los Angeles where you don't have that infrastructure, and at any price you can't build it now, uh, it's just not going to happen. Right. And so wanted to talk a little bit about a project that you have coming up. You've got a documentary that's coming up, but I'd like to put it in the context of what you just described and how you're bridging that gap between the rural and the urban and even to some degree the suburban kinds of lifestyles that are there. Talk to me about the motivation behind your documentary and ones like it and kind of the approach that you take when you're formulating the, the recipe for them. Sure. Well, you know, the, the media environment we're living in today is rapidly changing. How people learn about the world around them is, is very different than it was 20 years ago. You see newspaper subscriptions, uh, you know, falling away. You see uh, even successful news operations like Fox News relying less on hard news and more on commentary about the news. And you see people getting their information about the world around them, political information and news. 61% uh, of millennials primarily get that from Facebook. Uh, you see John Stewart and Colbert and others like that as the main source for a lot of young people's news. So uh, what, what you know, we have to do is find ways to um, educate people. People don't want to be educated as much as they want to be edutained, where it's actually educating through entertainment. And so one of the things I've been doing for a while now is uh, our, our short little video clips, and then I'll do some longer form videos like uh, these documentaries that I've done. And I use them as a way to entertain people, but also educate them in the process. With regards to uh, this project I'm doing right now, which is called No Water, No Farmer, No Food, uh, this is a story about California's water crisis. Why we have the water crisis, what can be done about it, and helping people primarily in urban areas understand what's happening in the Central Valley, what's happening in Northern California, what's happening in these areas that are really growing the food and supplying the food, not just for California, but 50% of all produce grown in the Central Valley is, is, um, is uh, or 50% of all produce sold in the United States comes from California's Central Valley. So it's not something that's just about California, it's something that's, that really affects the entire uh, country. So. And the world. Really. And the world. And the world, exactly. And people in the Central Valley understand this problem. People that live in rural parts of California have been dealing with a water crisis for a long time. It's just recently now that we are starting to ration water in cities and that people have brown lawns that all of a sudden everybody's, you know, m much more concerned about it. So I did this project not to go and reinforce what they already know in the Central Valley, but to take what they know and help people in the cities understand. Where does your food come from? When we're talking about water, why do we have the water system that we have in California and how is it being abused, misused, mismanaged, and how are things like the Endangered Species Act impacting our quality of life? Right. And so let's spend a minute on the Endangered Species Act as an example. I mean, you get things caught up in there that aren't necessarily even indigenous species sometimes that end up being protected under certain laws and everything else, or we get scenarios like the Delta smelt or the, the, the salmon that are up in the north yeah. that are all mixed up in this. What are you seeing out there? What came back from the documentary as far as um, the reality of putting animals above human lives? Sure. Well, in, environmentalism as an ism uh, covers a lot of things, a wide spectrum. But the fundamental goal is to disrupt the natural world as little as possible. And there's extreme, extreme... That's the stated goal. And, and that's, yeah, the stated goal is to, is to di you know, have mankind disrupt nature as little as possible. So when you're, when you're looking at something like the Endangered Species Act, uh, it becomes a, t a useful tool for the extreme elements of environmentalists. 
and a useful tool for them to use through the courts and through agencies like the Department of Interior to basically give a particular uh, wildlife, a, a fish or um, a wolf or something else, a status that gives them a certain right that in many cases exceeds mankind's right to a particular area or in this case to water. The, you know, the, the developed water that we built in California, developed meaning that mankind uh, did something with that water to control it. Um, we built these aquifers, we built these, uh, these uh, uh, aqueducts, we built the dams, all for the purpose of mankind's use. It was for farming to grow our food, it was for household use in, in urban areas, and for manufacturing. And all of a sudden we have this other user that's presented to us, forced into the system, which is, in this case, with uh, the water system in the delta, we have salmon and, and delta smelt that have now become another water user. And so when we're allowing 50% of all the developed water to run out to the ocean, many times under court orders, we're basically saying that those fish that were never part of the original design of the system have more rights than the human beings that that, uh, that water's being taken away from. Right, but you mentioned something very interesting. So a lot of people think, oh, well, if we just cut our uses or we don't water our lawns, then we're going to have all of this extra water, but we are releasing it directly into the ocean. We're doing things that allow it to evaporate as it travels down uh, the, the state. We're allowing antiquated uh, sewer systems or water delivery systems to just leak it out and waste it. Yeah. Do you get into in the documentary, do you have opinions just in, in regular outside life on some things that we might do that would actually improve the situation? I mean, obviously we can't control rainfall too much, right. but we can really conserve effectively or build up for rainy days, literally. What are your thoughts? Well, the point of this film is that the water crisis in California is 100% the fault of politicians in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. The drought is a natural problem. But the fact that we have a crisis in California is the problem that was created by mismanagement, as you talked about, by lack of foresight with um, our leaders you know, for the last 30 years that haven't built any new infrastructure to store more water. A lot of that has to, go, has to do with environmentalism. It goes back to that idea of we can't disrupt the natural world. And so they're being pressured not to do that. They're not showing leadership to say, look, we have to take care of the needs of a growing state. We, we widen our freeways. We, we do things with transportation as the state grows. Why wouldn't we do the same thing with water? And then lastly is the, you know, acts like the Endangered Species Act that basically allow a single judge to uh, mandate that 726,000 acre feet of water be flushed out to the ocean over a two month period. That same water could feed 700,000 people for a year. It's 10,000 jobs, almost a billion dollars in economic activity all because a single judge using the Endangered Species Act sends that water out to the ocean. Right, and we have other scenarios where they're actually trying to work in reverse to tear out dams and other things here in Northern California, which... Right, on the, and, and at a time when we're talking about uh, water storage and increasing that, uh, at the same time, these uh, you know utopian uh, environmental um, folks are, are wanting to tear dams out on the Klamath River Four, four perfectly good hydroelectric dams. And, and the funny thing is... That That's in, clean energy. You're talking about clean them energy, taking exactly. out clean energy. Well, the other thing, it's, you know, they claim it's all about the salmon, but in years of drought, like we're having right now, salmon couldn't survive there. So those dams are actually beneficial for the, for the very fish they're saying they're not benefiting. So um, it's, it's, a, it's this upside-down world where you put the interests of wildlife, and sometimes in a way that isn't even going to help the wildlife, above the interests of mankind. Right. Insanity. It's, it's, it's very crazy. And when you talk about solutions, look, I, I, we absolutely have to have some reforms to the Endangered Species Act, at the very least giving states or a governor some kind of veto power over that. And we have to say that in the state of California, uh, we, we absolutely must build more water storage. And we must manage the water that we have better. So we may have an El, El Nino, and we may have lots of an abundance of water again. Uh, I hope that doesn't mean that we slow down the interest we have right now in building more infrastructure. Well, and the whole point is, is when those times come, we have to have some way to collect that water and retain it for the times when it's not coming. That's right? exactly right, yeah. 
And just to clarify, I watch you on Facebook, yeah. <laughs> and it's not like you're anti-environment. It's not like you're anti-outdoors. You are the one of the most outdoorsy guys. You're around two kinds of wild animals, lots of politicians, and then things that uh, taste good when uh, cooked over an open fire or with yeah. apricot sauce is what I say. Well, I, I grew up in Montana. <laughs> I still have a place there. I spend uh, as much time outdoors as I can. I love the outdoors. I love the environment. I would call myself an environmentalist, but I think that word has been sort of turned into something else. I'm a conservationist. I want to see a clean environment. I want to see clean water. I want to see clean air. I want to see open spaces. But I want to do it in a way that doesn't impact the quality of life for mankind. And we, you know, I was asked by a, a reporter from the uh, Chicago Tribune a few weeks ago about the whole water crisis. And she said, well, you know, should man be building, you know, large cities like Los Angeles in desert areas? Should we be building uh, golf courses in dry, arid places? Uh, you know, should we be disrupting the natural world in order to take water out to a place like the Central Valley where we've turned a, you know, in my view, a, a desert into a garden that feeds, you know, as we talked about the world. Um, and I said, well, of course we should. And, and that's because we can and we can do it in a way that, that in many cases benefits nature. Yeah. I mean, we could have tumbleweeds and cactus in the Central Valley or we can have, you know, 200 different plants growing there and a $20 billion industry. Uh, what is better for mankind and really what's better even for the Central Valley, for the ecosystem? It's a farming ecosystem now. It's beautiful. Right. And if you look at, if we're really concerned about feeding the world, if we're really concerned about eradicating poverty, why would we not want people to have jobs? Why would we not want people to produce food? to feed the world. It, it's all, like you said, it's worse than backwards land or upside down land. It, it's like it doesn't even make sense to, it, it's constant conflict. Uh, interesting side note, one of the folks I was interviewing while I was doing this film from the Central Valley is a, uh, a Mexican immigrant and they said that their family back in Mexico was complaining about the produ produce that they can buy at the stores because as our produce production has decreased, we've taken more and more of the good produce from Mexico. So here it was affecting even the quality of what they can buy on the shelves in Mexico because we're sending water out to the ocean. Yeah, the height of silliness and beyond. What was the biggest aha you took or the thing that even made you scratch your head and go, what's going on here when you were doing the documentary? You know, I, I think one of the things that people realize the least about water use is how much virtual water is part of our everyday diet. Those numbers, when I talk about it, it sort of wakes people up to say, wow, um, you know, we understand better uh, how man uses water and how much uh, we are dependent on water. So the average almond takes about a gallon of water to produce. Uh, so if you go to 7-Eleven and you get a little package of almonds and you, well, in a virtual sense, you're consuming 30 gallons of water. That water had to be used in the Central Valley to produce those almonds for you. So when you look at an, you know, a diet for um, uh, you know, a family on a given day, a single egg takes 53 gallons of water. So if you have two eggs for breakfast, you just consumed in a virtual sense over 100 gallons of water. So we hear, you know, about this fight between fish and farmers. Well, it's not really a fight between fish and farmers. It's between sort of a radical environmentalism and consumers of food because the farmer's not eating all the lettuce. He's shipping that to somebody in the city. He's shipping his tomatoes to somebody that's consuming them. So the average, you know, when you look at just a chicken breast, uh, 130 gallons of water for a chicken breast, a glass of wine is 32 gallons of water to produce a single glass of wine. Coffee, because coffee takes 2,500 gallons of water per pound to produce it, takes about 35 to 37 gallons of water just for a cup of coffee. So in a given day, a person's diet, they're consuming 1,000, 1,500, maybe if you're eating a lot, up to 2,000 gallons of water in a virtual sense. You multiply that over a year, we're talking about millions of gallons for a household of water that is not part of what you're using with your daily use to water your lawns and all that. That's a very small fraction compared to what goes into our, into our diet, and that's what's happening in the Central Valley. Well, it's also interesting that you're seeing more news lately, for example, about that's the reason we have to reduce cattle production, and that's the reason we shouldn't be eating meat, we should be eating crickets, because crickets take so much less water to produce an individual cr cricket. So ground well, crickets are uh, yeah. coming to a plate near you. Well, and that goes back to the argument, should we have uh, uh, you know, golf courses in dry, arid areas? Well, yes, we should, because we can. Should we be? Absolutely. There's plenty of water. The water is not an issue. It's how we're managing it. Nature provides plenty of water for every person on the planet. We have about 45,000 gallons of fresh water that's produced. 
It's more in one place than it is in another, and that's why we build these great aqueduct systems. It's something mankind's been doing for thousands of years. You know, right. the Romans were perfecting this a long time ago. Right. So in modern times, we absolutely should be able to have as much beef as we want, and I love to consume beef and a lot of wild uh, meat as well. But uh, we should be able to do that, and we should be able to have golf courses in dry, arid areas because we can. It's just a matter of how we're managing our water. Absolutely. So I was just interested. Uh, obviously, there are going to be some places where people can see this out at traditional theaters and others, but you talked about some other non-traditional distribution mechanisms that you'll uh, be leveraging. Do you care to expand on that at all? Sure. Um, you know, we're going to use a lot of different to ways to get the word out about this film and get pieces of it out there. So we'll be doing a lot with social media, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all that. But, um, you know, there's been some I real interest from unique groups. For example, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles was interested in the project and wanted to distribute it out through their network of, of uh, churches in, in the L.A. Basin because a lot of them are, you know, it's Hispanic-oriented communities there. And they look at this as a life issue. It goes back to what's happening, you know, back home in Mexico for many of them with, with uh, you know, the produce and how it's impacting them. It's all the jobs that have been lost. And when you look at... Um, um, you know, that particular community who have been hit maybe the hardest in the, in the Central Valley, uh, it is a life issue for them. And a social justice issue, it sounds like they're discriminating yeah. against Hispanics who uh, could be right. making money for their families yeah. by cutting off the water. But my, my goal is not to take this film out and show it to people that already know all this and agree with it. In the Central Valley, they've been dealing with a water crisis for a long time as little by little their water's been taken away. This has been going on, you know, for them for years and years and years. Now that, you know, it's happening in the city, people are more curious about it. So I want to, you know, capture that curiosity and try to get as much exposure for this in urban areas where they can, you know, really be educated in an entertaining way on what's happening with water and why it's not common sense that we're using when we make decisions to send water out to the ocean or not build storage facilities for a growing population. But this is just all the more reason why people need to understand that politics um, is important in the way that these things work, but most people just don't pay attention until it affects them personally and individually. And that's what oh. we're starting to see now is that now it's in your face in the urban and suburban areas. And it's a good time to, to leverage that situation for sure. Well, there's a saying in politics that all politics is local. And when your lawn turns brown, the water crisis is now local. Yeah. Exactly. So if people wanted to find out more about the movie when it's released, where it'll be playing, or how to get their group involved in raising their hand to help with distribution, where can they find more information? Uh, no Water, No Farmer, No Food is the title of the film, and it's that.com. So No Water, No Farmer, No Food.com. And I still hear Bob Marley when you say that. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to write a song. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, one of the groups I'm very involved with here in California is Americans for Prosperity. If you go to Americans for, AmericansforProsperity.com, click on California, you can sign up, up for our emails and newsletters there. And we can keep people informed of what we're uh, doing on a lot of different fronts with uh, that group. Right. And um, as far as uh, for them to connect with you or to really uh, be able to watch for other projects, are those the best two mechanisms to use uh, going forward? Yeah, they're good. I, I have a channel as well on, on um, YouTube. If you Google me, uh, that's one way to, to find a lot of the content that, I've, that I have out there. Uh, follow me on Facebook, yeah. Twitter. Um, uh, Twitter's at David Spady. Uh, Facebook, David Spady. So, uh, and that's spelled S P A D Y. D Y, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, we appreciate you going passionately after the things you're going after, edutaining society, and really working to make an impact. So, thank you for being on the show as well. Thank you for having me. And if you hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. 
In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. And we appreciate them tremendously because for the last coming up on four years, they've kept us airing interesting guests like David and helping us to hopefully edutain the uh, society at large, but definitely to educate. Uh, and so the thing we should clarify, though, is that the thing that they're, both, they're best known for is not this show. It's actually for the speaker series that they have at 432 Stirling Road at the IFES Portuguese Hall about three minutes from here. That's actually why we were able to bring David on the show this evening, because he'll be speaking there tonight at 730. But coming up soon, for example, in November, we'll have Kurt Schlichter. He's an Army uh, colonel, trial lawyer, and national commentator for Fox News, Dennis Miller, Hugh Hewitt, and other shows. In December, we'll have our normal holiday event where we will be um, expanding a little bit into the new year, and that's actually a, a major drive for people to see what's coming up in the new year uh, starting in January with the forum. But you'll be able to get more information at theconservativeforum.com, and the show normally occurs there the second Tuesday of each month at 7.30. Again, David brought up some very interesting issues this evening about the differences between the rural, the suburban, and the urban areas within California and how different they can be, which we know is a microcosm of what's happening on a national scale. But it really is time for citizens across the spectrum to really get educated on why things happen the way they happen. The water crisis, for example, it's not the drought itself that is the, the pure culprit for the issues we face in California. It's a lot of the policies that are issued where people have a very limited perspective of what's going on and are legislating based on that limited view as opposed to taking in the big picture and actually planning proactively for growth of the population. So I encourage you to look more at Americans for Prosperity where you can find out more about David's upcoming project and others in the future. We appreciate your time this evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. But if you just can't wait, reach out to us at TheRightSideTV at gmail.com, and we'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Thanks again, and have a great night.